in continuing our study of the principles regarding the restoration of New Testament Christianity. I would like to note as the restorers stress the authority of the scriptures and sought to do as Paul told Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth as they studied it, 2 Timothy 2.15. They understood the power of an example as to one of the ways the New Testament authorizes us to act. Now, looking at the word example as to the dictionary definition, basically, if you look at any dictionary, it's going to say something to the effect that which is to be followed or imitated, a pattern. Thus, some begin to talk about the inspired blueprint for the church because a blueprint is a type of pattern it is that which is to be followed. It is that which is to be imitated. Thus, it's a form of teaching the person following it. It's a form of leading a person in a certain direction. So we mentioned this definition to emphasize that if a thing in the Scriptures is an example, then, of course, God expects us to follow it or to imitate the example. You've heard me use and you've used it concerning the word binding. Usually it's like I don't want to bind where God has not bound. Thus that is simply another way of saying I do not want to teach as obligatory upon man what God's word does not teach as an obligation because an obligation must be discharged. Thus I've got to be careful in teaching lest i teach as obligatory what God has not made obligatory. And you had a problem with that in the early church. Interesting to me that the first big problem in the church was not one of people loosing the brethren from what God and his word had bound on them, but it was one of binding where God had not bound. You had the Judaizing teachers. They were Jews who had converted they believed in Christ. They had obeyed the gospel. But when it came to the Gentiles, beyond hearing the gospel, understanding it, believing it, repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in Christ, being baptized, they would say a Gentile had to be circumcised, keep the law. Now that was making a law where God didn't make one. That's what we mean by binding. Saying something is authorized in the sense that it must be done when God does not teach such. And that challenges us as to our own honesty in the approach to the Bible, Luke 8, 15, which is a must if we're to understand the way of salvation. And it challenges us to make sure we can be sure that we're doing things only because we know the Bible teaches it. And thus, the idea of an example comes to bear as one of the ways the New Testament authorizes us to act. There have been times when people have asked, well, when is an example binding? And I don't believe that to be the right question. I think in trying to understand that an example, a pattern must be followed, a pattern, an example, that we ought to be asking, when does the Bible account of an action constitute a pattern or example? Because when you read, let's just take the book of Acts, for example. When you read through the book of Acts, we often call it the historical section of the New Testament. It tells about the beginning of the church in Acts 2 in Jerusalem. And it goes on to talk about the early days of the spread of the gospel and people becoming Christians and the church being established hither and yon very early on. And one of the things that you begin to, to notice there are all the different things that they did. That is, different actions that were taken. But are all those actions that the early church took a pattern that we must follow in every case? So I've got to figure out a way that I can know 
which actions constitute an example, remember our definition of an example, and which ones do not. I also must understand when I've determined that something is an example, an action is an example, is it a pattern that allows me to do something or is it obligatory? I think that needs to be understood and it may take us, well I know it needs to be understood, but it may take us a while to get that in our minds when we're delineating the words and the truth that's in the scriptures. And I'll choose this example from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now you remember that the brethren in Corinth had a lot of problems. I've never been around a church, any one congregation that had as many problems as that church did, but it was still the Lord's church. Look at the way the Holy Spirit had Paul address the letter to the church of God, which is at Corinth. But one of the problems they were having in that congregation was the abuse of the Lord's Supper. And in the process of correcting their errors in observing the Lord's Supper, you find that Paul goes back over the Lord's institution of that supper. Look in verse 24, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul making reference to the Lord instituting the Lord's Supper. And when he had given thanks, speaking of the bread, verse 23, he break it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now when I look through the scriptures, I see that I am instructed on this matter by precept and example to observe this supper on the first day of every week. Now, you can look all the way through the New Testament, which you ought to do, at everything that is recorded there about the Lord's Supper. And you will never find an explicit statement, just so many words, saying that on the first day of the week in the worship assembly, the saints, one of the acts of worship is to observe the Lord's Supper in that assembly. You cannot find it. It's not there. Well, then how do we know? Well, we do have precepts concerning the same. We have instruction on doing it. And when you come to Acts 20 and verse 7, you have good insights into that. Luke, by inspiration, records this. Paul, if you look at the verses preceding Acts 20 and verse 7, is in quite a hurry to get to Jerusalem before the time of the Passover. Yet when he comes to Troas, Notice what verse 6 says. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. Now, even in the way they had to travel then, waiting in a place seven days before you move on, when you're in a hurry to get to a place, is still quite a time to wait. So I asked the question, why did he wait there seven days? I learned from verse 7. Notice that this sentence begins with a conjunction which joins it with the things he's just got through saying. And then those seven days it says, and upon the first day of the week. What about that? What about this historical record of the action these brethren in Troas were taking? Well, they had a habit of doing something. Something. 
and it was assembling on the first day of the week. When the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now, verse 8 said, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And we see there was at least one window because a man, young man named Eutychus got in it and went to sleep and fell out. So, uh, people are people wherever you are. Now, consider what we have here in Luke's inspired account of Paul being in Troas. I just read to you from 1 Corinthians 11, and I did two things in one reading. Paul is quoting Jesus, setting up the Lord's Supper. So you go back to the passages in the books of the life of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can find him doing that as those writers recorded. But now Paul shows how he used that to correct problems in the church of Corinth and they're observing of it, explaining, teaching about that supper and how it is an act of worship on the first day of the week, except the first day of the week is not mentioned there. But over here it is. Now, knowing that everything about any one topic is not found just in one word or one verse or even a few verses, we must, as we've said most often, take all of what the Bible says on the subject, in this case the New Testament of Christ, what all it says about the Lord's Supper before we start reasoning with the facts and then draw our conclusion. So we know it's authorized. We learn that from, Matt, from um, Jesus' own setting up the Lord's Supper. It's authorized. We know that you can abuse it because the people in the brethren in Corinth did, and we know it can be corrected because Paul corrected them. And in doing so, he hearkened back to the time that Jesus had instituted it. And we see the elements in it. We see that there's the bread and there's the fruit of the vine, what the bread represents is emblematic of, and what the fruit of the vine represents or is emblematic of. But here's the place where we find at least one place where it mentions first day of the week. As I said, Paul's in a hurry, but he wants to see the brethren. Now, faithful brethren are going to all assemble on the first day of the week. So he can wait there seven days, and they'll all be there if they're faithful. And at one time, he can see every one of them. And that's exactly what the Scriptures record that he did. And it tells us why they were doing that, because they were coming together on the first day of the week to break bread. Now, let's do a little thinking here. The Lord's Supper is far more than just literally taking bread and breaking it. You see that to break bread means to partake of a meal originally. And that was used. It wasn't too long even in our English language in our country when if somebody says, how about coming home breaking bread with me tonight? Well, would you think he's inviting you home to come sit around a room and get bread of some sort and sit there and just break it? You would know he's inviting you to supper or dinner or something. And so they did in that day and time. So break bread was what's called a synecdoche in grammar. It means where part either stands for the whole thing or whole for the part. And in this case, the bread that is involved in the Lord's Supper that's emblematic of the body of Christ offered on Calvary's cross for us is used to stand at least for the Lord's Supper. But now the worship on the first day of the week is far more than just assembly and take the Lord's Supper. So it's my conclusion that to break bread in this assembly was to worship God and all the five acts of worship. It just simply stood for that worship. It's like Jude 3, contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Well, faith is only an item of the gospel. It's not uh, all of the gospel. There's repentance, and there's confession, and there's baptism, and there's various other things connected. But when there's a major part, a significant part, that is pulled out to stand for the whole thing, and that's what happens in Jude 3 in contending for the faith. And in this case, I firmly believe, since the worship consists of more than the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, that to break bread not only refers to the Lord's Supper, but it refers to the whole of the worship. I think some people have very well uh, got that confused 
because I've seen brethren who thought they were doing all right. I don't know why they didn't want to stay and sing or stay and pray or stay and give their means as they ought to do or to hear a lesson from God's Word. They come in long enough to take Lord's Supper and leave. Well, why not? If it's the most important part, come and do the most important part and leave. But that's not what's said here, is it? These brethren with an apostle present and an apostle who had taught them what they ought to do in the worship of God on the first day of the week knew they would be assembling and though he's in a hurry to go to Jerusalem, he waits seven whole days to assemble with them because he knew the disciples would assemble on the first day of the week to break bread. That is, to worship God acceptably. The breaking of bread being one of those things. Now you can assemble at any other time on any other day of the week and engage in singing and in prayer and in Bible study. You can do that. Even individually, if you come across somebody tomorrow that has a need you can pull out of your pocket and however you want to do it, supply that need if they're hungry. That doesn't substitute for the giving that you're to do in the assembly of the saints on the first day of the week. It just means it doesn't limit that to the first day of the week. So individually, whoever we are, we're to do good to all men, aren't we? So that's a part of doing that. But now when it comes to the Lord's Supper, search as you may, there is no time or place to observe the Lord's Supper save in the assembly of the saints to worship God on the first day of the week is one of the acts of worship. Thus, when we put it all together concerning all the New Testament teaches about worshiping God in the church, we see, as I said, you can sing praises to God. James plainly says that if any man's married, let him sing a psalm. Well, you may be more in the yard and you can be singing a psalm. You may be standing at the kitchen sink and be singing a psalm because that's what you can do. Why can you do it? You're authorized to do it. But not in the assembly of the saints. Everybody sings there. They speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, we don't want to get to the point where we say concerning this ties in this morning's lesson on singing to where we say, well, the only way that we can ever sing unless we want to go to hell is to sing congregational singing. Now, if you're going to prove that, how would you set about to prove it? You mean you can't get together as a family at home and sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with the right attitude of mind toward God and toward the song? Of course you can. But now these are regulations concerning the first day of the week assembly for worship. So, uh, concerning now the Lord's Supper, Paul knew they had been taught regarding when they would take the Lord's Supper, when they were to worship, and so, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. One of the reasons that we have preaching on the first day of the week in that assembly, we see that Paul did it. Now, if there had been a problem, Paul's an inspired apostle. He would have corrected it. How do I know? Because he did it Corinth. He did not hesitate to correct the problems they had there. And one of them was with the Lord's Supper. They were turning it into a common meal. I've heard some brethren over the last several years just try to make the Lord's Supper some sort of snack over to the side of the auditorium. When you get up there in the auditorium, you can walk over there and just get you some and sit down whenever the mood hits you. I've heard of people saying, well, let's make it more uh, reverential, whatever they meant by that. And so when we're observing the Lord's Supper, let's be singing a song pertaining to the death of Christ. That sounds good, doesn't it? Help our minds stay on what we're doing when we take the Lord's Supper. Now, if you're thinking like I hope you will, you'll ask the question, Where's the New Testament authority for mixing two acts of worship in a, in a worship assembly? Where is it? There's not. Each act was carried out independent of the other acts. There was no mixing of such things. Now, when you start deviating from the pattern, from the authority of the Lord's Word, I don't know where you stop. 
you only stop as far as people don't want to go. So learning to ascertain the authority of the Lord as it is in the words of the New Testament and learning how the New Testament authorizes keeps us just where we ought to be. You know, if you're steering um, a ship with a rudder and it has a steering wheel on it, so to speak, and you want to keep it going a certain direction, you have to set it accordingly so it'll go that direction. I don't know what people do if they say, well, I live in Conroe. I'm just going to let the wheel go where it may. And it'll find Conroe sometime or another. I guarantee you uh, it won't find Conroe. And if you're still in it, you probably will find eternity. <laughs> we don't, in other words, use that kind of thinking when it comes to getting from point A to point B here. We know it takes a pattern, a road map, some proper way of traveling from point A to point B, and effort has to be put in on our part to follow the way a thing works, however the mode of transportation works, to get it there. Well, we're talking about worshiping God, being faithful as Christians. We're talking about understanding the word of truth. So when we see the Lord's Supper observed, we see brethren who had had the apostle teach them who he knows if they're faithful will assemble on the first day of the week to break bread. And that's what they do. And Paul preached on them, continued speech until midnight. Now, you say, well, what about there were many lights in the upper chamber? That involves where they were. Wouldn't that be just as binding that if we worship God, we'll have to be in an upper chamber? And happy at night where there are many lights or it won't be acceptable to God. Well, those things have no bearing on the observance of the Lord's Supper. They're incidental. It would be like saying, well, we have to have a PA system in order to worship God acceptably in preaching or in teaching or in singing. No, that just helps us do what we're obligated to do. So then there's an example that they did meet in the upper chamber where there are many lights. Notice it says where they were gathered together. They convened there. They assembled there. But that has nothing to do, has any bearing whatsoever on the partaking of the Lord's Supper. When you see what is involved in observing the elements and partaking of them and eating the bread and drinking the fruit of the vine. None whatsoever. So it is an example, but it simply may be followed. It's not obligatory. What is obligatory? The observance of the Lord's Supper. And that they do. And you can observe the Lord's Supper on a ground floor. You can observe it under a shade tree. You can observe it wherever it's capable of being observed. So we have to then understand when you're reading the scriptures, there are matters that certainly are patterns for us to follow. But if we don't follow those patterns, because they have no direct bearing on discharging the obligation. We're all right. But when it comes to following something that causes us to violate the example that teaches us to assemble in the worship assembly of the saints on the first day of the week to worship God, one item of worship being the Lord's Supper, that's another story. That changes the whole apple cart. That's the reason people, going back to our sermon this morning, can't see the difference in a mechanical instrument of music like a piano and a songbook. They don't understand that's another kind of music. The songbook is just there. If you use it for what it was meant to use for, what are you going to do? Well, it's called a songbook. It has songs in it. We all can be on the same page and we can all sing the same songs, thus be decently in order about that singing. And when it comes to the Lord's Supper, there's various ways we could partake of the Lord's Supper as one of the acts of worship on the first day of the week. We could all get up and file by that are members of the church and partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine. But everybody's pretty well recognized that the best option, the most advantageous option to discharge the obligation is for it to be served everybody and let them make up their own mind as to partake of it as it comes by 
And so that's what we teach and that's what we do. Let every man consider himself. Of course, only Christians, scripturally, should be taking the Lord's Supper. Why? Well, it's very obvious. It shows forth the Lord's death till he come. And if you're not a Christian, and you're ignoring that death that he died for you to save your soul, why would you partake of it? So it's obvious that's true. But the church has no authority to say, you can't partake of it and we're not going to serve it to you. You have to make up your own mind on that after being taught the truth as to who should partake of it. Now I say in uh, this passage, Acts 20 and 7, we have the first day of the week mentioned. It's not the only place. And that's another good point to keep in mind. If you'll turn with me over to 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 16, uh, you need to understand this because same apostle, same apostle that was involved in observing the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week in Troas, Acts 20 and 7, is the one who expressing to the churches the collection of the money, if you want to call it that, he says plainly in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 16, now concerning the collection of the saints, now watch what he says, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, that's a whole big province, all the congregations, however many there were, he's given order to those churches. Even so do ye, who's the ye? Corinthians. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. There's two times, first day of the week is, which, uh, is mentioned, whereby people are, as Christians, are to do stuff on it. Well, by the time you take Acts 20 and 7, and then you take 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, it becomes obvious that they were customarily assembling on the first day of the week, according to the apostles' doctrine, and doing these things in that assembly. Now there's the pattern. There's the authority set forth in a pattern, something to be followed. There is a pattern that is obligatory. It must be done. Now I don't know why some people have decided that they can take the Lord's Supper outside the bona fide worship assemblies of a congregation and everything's all right. If that was the case, we just take it at home. Be done with it. People decide those things. They're just like the denominations. They do it when they couldn't find at all anywhere in the New Testament any authority to do that. They just do it because they think they've got to take the Lord's Supper. Well, they do have to take the Lord's Supper according to the instructions of the Lord. I cannot find anywhere in my New Testament, and I challenge you to try, where people are authorized to take the Lord's Supper outside of the worship assembly of the saints. Now, if I'm in a city and there's no church there, I constitute the church. I've been in that situation before. And thus, I'm going to worship as the church. I asked Brother Ira Rice one time, how did you start the church when you first went to Singapore in the mid-1950s? Because there wasn't any church of our Lord in the city of Singapore or the nation of Singapore. He said, well, we were Christians. My family and I got there. We got settled in the apartment. I made some signs up, and, and when the first day the, well, on Saturday afternoon before the, before the first day of the week, I went out and set up the Church of Christ, worship services, whatever time it was, on Sunday morning. And then we assembled there and worshiped like the New Testament teaches us to worship on the first day of the week. We were the church. Anybody else was that welcome. Brother, that's what amazes me about our brethren. We've gotten so used to moving to a place where the church already exists, we don't want to do if it doesn't exist. Why should we be that way above all people on this earth? If we move to a place where there is no church, what do you do? You are the church. And you start worshiping. And you let it be known you are the church. And at a certain place, you are there every first day of the week to do what God requires of you. Now, you may assemble otherwise. Now, Bible studies or whatever else. You will if you're trying to teach people the truth and convert them. But we have such a, of a funny view of the church. The church simply are people who from the heart have heard the gospel and believed it and obeyed it. They've given their life to Christ and being baptized for the remission of sins. The Lord's added them to the church. And wherever they are, they do what the Lord requires. And that involves on the first day of the week, they're going to worship God according to the way he ordains in the New Testament to worship. 
And therefore, when the church is fully organized, where you have a congregation of people, you have elders to oversee, and you have deacons to serve, you have preachers to teach, you have teachers, you have members, and they come together because they're taught to come together on the first day of the week. And where they come together, they must be able to do in that assembly what God says you ought to do in that assembly. You must do in that assembly if you worship me in spirit and in truth correctly. And so in this case, to sing, and another case it would be, as we're studying now, to observe the Lord's Supper. And we mentioned the contribution. That's where that's done. How do you take up the contribution? <laughs> Well, think about it. Are there various ways you could? You might be surprised in studying over the years of the church, the last 150 years. There were times people actually left their contribution as, as they went out the back door. There were times when they came forward and left their contribution in the basket. It was a matter of collecting it and giving it on the first day of the week in that assembly. That doesn't seem difficult to me. But you see, here's the danger, and Satan can use a good thing and make it into something it shouldn't be. We get used to doing a certain thing in a right way, in a comfortable way, and we fail to realize why we arrived at that in the first place. Somebody did. Somebody decided to do that. Wednesday night. There was a time, if you went in, this, in the churches of Christ many, many years ago, there wouldn't have been hardly any assemblies on, in midweek. Can you guess why? Well, a little difference getting in your car five miles from here and driving here in a few minutes, even in a bad day of traffic, and getting in a buggy or getting on a horse, getting the family all ready, feeding all the stock before you leave, milking the cows, and then coming here. You won't do it in a few minutes. And if you're living up where some of you live, you're going to take almost half a day to get here if it's in a wagon or in a buggy or on a horse. And thus, situations and circumstances handicapped a lot of things. So the church many times met only on the first day of the week one time. And they usually would have Bible classes. There would be one class in this corner, one class in that corner, one class in this corner, one class in Somebody would be teaching here if they decide to have classes. But they were used to that because guess what? That was in the days of the one-room schoolhouse in the first place where you had all grades being taught all the same room at the same time. Nobody thought anything about it. Point is, it reaches a stage in modern conveniences to where we have a lot more options, to where we can do things. I suggest to you that this congregation would have a hard time existing nowadays if all of a sudden we had to go back to riding buggies and wagons and walking and riding a mule or riding a horse. I don't Ken, how long would it take you to get here if you had to ride a mule? <laughs> I could ask several of you that. Well, we don't live that far away. But I'd hate to have to get up and saddle a horse and ride over here. And that'd be a short distance for what people had to do a long time ago. I can remember a brother telling me when he was a child growing up, he said we would there was a debate between Benny and Bogard and Joe Warlick, way out there in the country, I know right where it was, nothing there now but woods. And he said, we had to go quite a few miles and it was cold. He said, Daddy heated up a whole bunch of bricks and put them in a sack, put them in the back of that wagon. We threw quilts all over it, got there, stuck our feet up against it, said we went until the bricks were cold and we were cold too to get to that debate. It wouldn't take, I know where that is, I know where they were coming from. It wouldn't take long at all to drive that in a car nowadays. You have to keep those things in mind relative to understanding even the scriptures. Notice, Paul says he abode there seven whole days until the church came together on the first day of the week. And they came together on the first day of the week because they were authorized to, to worship God on that first day of the week. And it centered around the breaking of bread and the other acts of worship we know that went on, such as singing and prayer, contributing of their means and so on. It's very simple to understand but if you don't watch out you let the way we do things handicap what we can do what we may do what we can change and what we can't change and why we should change I am not one who believes and I think the Bible teaches this a change for the sake of change if we're going to change doing something a certain way let it benefit better let it benefit us better in discharging the obligation 
If it won't benefit us better in discharging the obligation, if it doesn't make it more advantageous, why change? I remember the G.K. Wallace making this point on this same type of subject. He said, you know, I've been going out for meetings for years and years and years. He said, I don't know what I would think if one time when I came back from a meeting, and he used this terminology, he said, Ms. Wallace was out singing some sort of song publicly that welcomed me back. The next time I came home, she had a quartet out there singing songs of some sort that welcomed me back. The next time I came back to the meeting, she had a brass band out there playing welcomed me back. Another time, she had a chorus out there. How did that accomplish anything? Meaning that if the thing works and by changing it, it doesn't help us better discharge the obligation, let it work. Circumstance situations may determine what is good, better, or best. But there is no good, better, or best in discharging the obligation. It's just get the obligation discharged that God said. When it comes to Noah, we used him this morning, and building the ark. I do not know what all he used to transport that wood or to cut that wood. I don't know what all he used to put on the tar that he sealed it up with. Don't know. God left that up to him. So you can see the things he was obligated to do that if he deviated from it, he sinned. And yet in every one of them, there were those things he was set at liberty to do in getting done only what God told him to do in discharging the obligation. And so it is when it comes to the Lord's Supper. So I see first day of the week in my giving. I see first day of the week in observing the Lord's Supper. I see it to be done in the assembly of the saints. Why otherwise? I have no authority for it otherwise. I'm content to let it rest that way. Because when Christ judges me, he won't judge me about what I think is good, better, best. He'll judge me on the basis of his word. And his word reads now like it'll read then. It'll mean then like it means now. And if we can understand that when it comes to the plan of salvation, we can understand that when it comes to the organization, work, and worship of the Lord's church, and we can understand that when it comes to the worship of the Lord's church, how we arrive at the acts of worship, and how we engage in every one of them, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Well, if you're not a Christian, we still offer you the authorized, New Testament authorized plan of salvation. Believing in Christ is a necessity. It's obligatory. Repenting of your sins is obligatory. It's actually keeping a commandment, Acts 17.30. There is a confession of one's faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10.10. 10. And then to get into Christ, there's only one way. To be immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit into Christ to become a Christian. There's no other way. Now, as far as getting you in the water deep enough to bury you, might have a baptistry, might have a pond of water. I baptize in all sorts of things. Burn tank in the hospital, bathtub, gravel pit in Arkansas. As long as the water was deep enough and that was what was there, we used it. Well, we have an opportunity now to understand the difference in the obligation that must be discharged and everything God's authorized us to do. And in those things that aid us in the doing of it, regardless of our circumstance, situation, any time in history. You can observe the Lord's way if you want to. And if you want to be safe, you can. And you don't bring in what ifs. You just know what he said, and you're glad to do it. If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to do that then while we stand and sing.